So when you start getting in, into certain levels of, of neural networks, when you're looking at neural networks, adaptive filters, all of these things start to become important. And historically, these start to create the foundation for most of what we're familiar with when we start talking about machine learning and neural networks. These create the foundation of not just the feed-forward calculations, but also in terms of the sort of foundation of what we mean by learning. And so I want to talk about just some of these basic ideas here and talk about just also a little bit where the history of this goes. So when we start talking about a single a single sort of neuron, right? We're going to talk about here as a perceptron, or talk, you might say it was a single neuron, this, uh, layers of this would be perceptrons. This goes back to Rosenblatt in 1957, 58. This is really layers of McCullough and Pitts neurons in coming from 1943 is their attempt to have some sense of what neuroscience is doing, what some sense of the neurons themselves are giving us. Okay, so in all these cases, you're usually talking about a vector of inputs and a whole set of weights. For the perceptron, you sum all that up, and then you get into a neuron in a perceptron, or in what we call a Pitts neuron as a threshold. This could, all, of course, also be some other different kinds of functions. And then you get a particular output y, y1, y1 in this case. It's a nonlinear function of that. Um, it also turned out for adaptive filters, which most people typically see a lot of that activity in like the early 1960s. Um, this really has its roots in Bernie Woodrow, uh, who did a lot of this work. This is really interesting because it's really not looking at it with a nonlinearity at the back end, but just looking at it purely as a linear system, which is the conversation talking about as an adaptive filter. Now you might ask, okay, these are somewhat related. It turns out the learning rule that you get for an adaptive filter looks like about the same thing you get for a perceptron. So it's kind of a little bit easier to think about the adaptive filter, but it's also more relevant because these two individuals had a lot of communication between each other in the late 50s and early 60s and, and, and very positive conversations. And so there really was a synergy between the, the concepts that were being developed here. And adaptive filters became a standard concept that by the time you got to the 1980s, you just use this anywhere. No one really thought twice about it. Um, and so it, it's pretty much considered a standard thing in any sort of signal processing concepts today. So it's worth kind of thinking about what do you have here and realizing that all of the, the conversations in math you see here and in intuition will start to apply not only to perceptrons, but to any other neural structure, whether it's a um, you know, neural network, machine learning, or more even more neuromorphic techniques, this sort of shows up again and again. So here we're gonna be talking about a vector of inputs, a whole set of weights, where basically the output Y is just gonna be gonna be some sort of uh, inner product of those that input vector and the weight vector. Great. But the other thing you get is also a desired signal, Y hat. This is what you want the signal to, Y is what it is, Y hat is what you want it to be. And so there's an error between what you have and what you want it to be. And so we're gonna talk about that error as being something very important as we do these calculations. This really began the starting point of asking, wow, I'd like to have a training set to solve something or find a way to get a desired signal, which maybe I can find a, a desired signal from some other part of my system I'm using. All sorts of possibilities, but this sort of is start, starts the conversation. Um, so the discussions around data sets and related kind of training around it is a known concept that goes back, like I said, to the early 60s and how you would kind of put this together. Now, you can talk through this algorithm, which is basically you talk about what is the change in the weight, and the way to think about it is, is a differential equation. Certainly Bernie Woodrow, when he started it, that's how it was formulated. That's how much of these algorithms are formulated. Um, you can certainly build a discrete time version of it, but we're gonna kind of keep to this kind of grounding all the way through, um, partially because you, the mathematics are solid and easy enough to show that you always converge and it's always stable. And the mathematics work in, in a very, uh, in a very nice way and, a, and, and come together in a nice way. You end up finding the learning rule is minus 2x, and x is a vector here, bold times e. Now, this actually comes from minimizing a quadratic function. So that's why you often talk about these approaches as least mean square. 
because you're actually minimizing a quadratic function, which might be why you'd imagine there's a 2 there. Uh, think the derivative of x squared is 2x. This is effectively where this, what's going on here. It's minus because what your sin is saying is that I want to go in, I want to sort of go downhill from this sort of cost function that I'm creating. You might call it an energy function, um, fair enough. Some people might debate that conversation. We'll just kind of call it a cost function and keep it simple. And at this point, we'll just go, that's what the learning algorithm was. It was this product between the error signal, again, here's the error signal, and the inputs. And notice that basically if I project the error signal to all these elements, this means that all of the training is done locally at these boxes that's doing this product. That's, really, that's what kind of the locality means. Uh, locality does not mean I do not have an ability to broadcast a voltage broadcast a term, which is often voltage, and so that's just a natural thing. You can also imagine that if I have a current summing things, that's also a local calculation, because I'm not getting outside of that space any differently. So this is kind of, there's a sense of locality that shows up, and it's often where you build mesh architectures, which people may know as a crossbar or something like that. There's a lot of history around those ideas. and. In terms of what do I do with these kinds of small layers and really try to build these things up. A lot of those concepts really got solidified in the 1980s and early 90s in this, in this field. So then I started to say, okay, great, this is my mathematical model, but what I then we go, well, how do I analyze this model? This is very nice. Does it, what does it do, right? How do I think about it? Well, the nice part of this being a linear system is there's some, I can very directly solve and analytically solve for this. But there's some concepts I need to be aware of as I'm doing this. One of which is, okay, let's start by taking this differential equation. I know what E is, so let me substitute in for it. I know what Y is, let me substitute in for it. And then I just group terms and I get a very interesting result when I push through all of this. You're like, great. How do I make heads or tails of this equation? Well, here's where some very key concepts come into play. And are often thought it was just like simple as, oh, these are assumptions we just put off on the side here. But not getting these assumptions means you don't actually understand the learning algorithm at all. And you don't understand sort of the, the various dynamics that are going on here. So let's start with a couple of these. One, the, the input is zero mean. Uh, and this is important because I'm going to be looking at how do things change with the input and how do, how do I get some correlations of these elements and I would like to be able to build on that. Um, what is connected to this is that x must be a fast time scale and the weight changing is a slow time scale. So x being zero mean means if I integrate over periods of the fast time scale it's going to be zero. And also, if I integrate over the weight over some period of periods of the time scale, it's going to not move much. It's going to basically just be the same weight. And that turns out to be very helpful in terms of setting up the differential equation. This other aspect of x being fast time scale means that I'm going to set up another matrix Q, which is now going to be x, x transpose. This gives me what is typically thought of as a correlation matrix, which is to say, how does one input uh, look, you know, how does one input, is it similar to another? Um, and so if it was like completely un different, which you call uncorrelated, then I would get a Q matrix, which is a, di a diagonal matrix. And to the extent to which certain things feel similar, it's going to be off of diagonal. Create a similar sort of vector R in terms of the X and the Y hat, which is its desired value. Not as much of a direct interpretation, but fair enough, it's a thing. But if I do that, this differential equation, the xx transpose, turns out to be a constant matrix Q. The second term here turns out to be an R. And my differential equation looks like a matrix differential equation. The W doesn't change. The other W doesn't change. And so now it looks like it's simply a discussion of converging over W. You must understand when you look at this so that that You've got a very different time scale for the inputs and a very different time scale for the weight change. So this is inherently um, you know, a multi-time scale problem, which is actually 
used in so many different places. You see a lot of different biological systems, a lot of physical systems. It's also a stiff set of differential equations. So numerically, this is tough. And so you have to be very aware of the numerical problems with solving it in this form. Uh, and this is true for a lot of different learning algorithms. And, and a lot of the questions that come up come up from effectively related aspects of the numerics. Uh, by the way, it's a continuous time physical system. It solves perfectly well, and it's really nice, which that also might surprise you that there's a, that we speak more confidently on physical systems than digital arithmetic, but that's a whole longer conversation to have. But you can actually find there's a steady state. This is related to Q and R, and take the Q inverse and R is actually what the solution is, is what it'll solve to. Uh, it's an interesting concept, because if you say I need to solve a set of linear equations, this is, you can always create a Diffie Q to do that. Um, this, but it's there's this whole conversation of let me start with these elements, have a desired data set, actually will create all of this mathematics, and there's in deep intuition in the mathematics. And you can go layer and layer and layer through this to understand it. Um, and if you want to understand some of the, the dynamics behind, say, backpropagation for two layers or many layer networks, you want to start to understand these concepts.